Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the organizers um, for and the volunteers for making WordPress WordCamp happen this year. Um, I'm very thankful to all of them. This has been uh, quite a lot of work to get here. Um, so I'm very excited to be here. Um, and thank you so much for my team, some of who is with me here today, um, and some of who I know is watching online. Um, we are all very friendly, and we are all very excited to be here and talk with you all and collaborate with you all. So um, please approach us if you see us. We're all wearing our Disney name tag. It's the Disney look. It's what you got to do. Um, so please come up to us and say hello. Um, so today, I'm going to be telling you all a story. Um, because after all, that's what Disney does best, is we tell stories. Um, so I'm going to try my best to recreate some of that magic for you here today. Um, and the common theme that obviously brings us all together is WordPress. And I know that we're a really big company, and I know that our situation may not reflect everyone here, but I tried to imbue this presentation with some small little um, ideas and lessons and pieces of knowledge that we learned, and I hope that everyone can take something back from this presentation. All right, um, so first things first, Disney initiation. Um, we always start with a Walt quote, so I'm going to do the exact same thing for you guys. Um, and this one is one of my favorite. We keep moving forward, opening new doors, and doing new things because we're curious. And curiosity keeps leading us down new paths. Um, so this is just a little bit of an agenda to let you guys know where we're at and what we're going to be talking about. Um, and like every great story, this presentation is going to be structured as such. We're going to have a little bit of conflict, a rising action, a crescendo, and the resolution. And I just want to like quickly point out that this is one of my favorite parts of the park. This is the little DJ that's in the cantina in Galaxy's Edge. Um, so I try to put little references around the park for the people that know. Okay, uh, so first things first, who are we and what exactly does Disney experiences mean? Um, so Walt Disney Company is obviously a massive company. Um, so when you think of Disney, what you probably think of is Disney Entertainment. So that's everything from the movie studios, the television studios, um, streaming, music and theater. Um, but the larger part of the company staff-wise is actually Disney Experiences. And Disney Experiences encompasses everything from um, our domestic and international theme parks, our hotels and resorts, our cruise line, um, our guided tour businesses, um, merch, games, publishing, licensing, and all of our housing communities. Um, so where myself and my team particularly sits is we sit in Disney Experiences Communications. Um, and we're called communications technology. So we try to bring um, communications tools to all of our large communications department to um, display whatever message they need to display. Um, so a little bit about me. Just um, I have been working with WordPress uh, for as long as I have been working. Um, my first job ever was a web developer. Um, and I was at a very small agency building websites for people. Um, uh, I'm usually a UX engineer in other positions, which is a designer that both straddles the world of design and development. It's definitely a very new concept. Definitely a lot of people don't know what it is, and that's totally okay if you don't either. Um, but I joined Disney only two years ago, and this was actually my first big project. Um, and like most people at Disney, um, this was my dream job. Um, so I grew up going to Disney and I grew up going to theme parks and amusement parks. Um, they're all very special to me. Those are all pictures of me and my family visiting um, the K Castle for anyone who knows what that is. Um, got to see it in person. Um, in my particular role, I'm a UX lead, meaning that I'm driving the product vision and some of the strategy of um, the products that I'm going to be showing you today, but I also work in sort of the trenches every day and day-to-day -day tasking with our design and our developers. Um, one of my favorite things about working for Disney is just simply how fun it is. So that middle picture that you see um, was actually the day that we went code complete on Disney Parks blog. Um, we stayed up super, super late and we work behind Hollywood Studios and Disney World. So we kind of like went and ditched the code for a couple minutes and went to go watch Fantasmic, which is one of our night shows. Um, and it was just 
so, so special. It was so magical. Um, and that right there is actually our engineering team. And I just want to point out that, that yes, that is a team of all women engineers. Um, yeah. Um, it's so incredibly special to me um, to be able to be in a team with these women. Um, and another fun fact as well, um, I am a new mom with an 18-month-old. I actually started at Disney when I was 16 months pregnant. Um, <laughs> And I had, uh, I got to visit with my daughter Sophie when she was only five months old. Um, that's her right there meeting Mickey Mouse. I think right now she pronounces it like, pronounces it like Mickey Magaga, um, which is super cute. It's her fave. Um, but keep in context that this whole entire story I'm about to tell you and this whole whirlwind we just went through was happening while I was pregnant and on maternity leave and immediately a new mom. And I know that any mom in the audience knows how big of a deal that is and how hard that was. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna first try to take you guys through some context of the problem we were really trying to solve at Disney. Um, so we had a bit of a sticky situation. Um, so we have an extremely high internal demand for websites, as we know, um, communications is a moving increasingly on the web. Um, and every time that we would do one of these new sites, we would build new code. And new code requires fresh, um, fresh security reviews, fresh everything, right? Um, and our aging code also meant that we were increasingly having these websites that had an outdated SEO, had outdated accessibility practices. Um, it was quite a beast. And we did have some existing WordPress solutions, um, but they were primarily built on um, like a whole host of different page builders. And as we know, um, there are obviously a lot of page builders that are very supported and that continue support. But when you're making those decisions 15 years ago, a lot of those page builders are still not around. Um, so we had a lot of um, problem migrating from page builder to page builder. Um, it led to increased costs, security risks, um, expired support. Um, we're, we were reinventing the wheel every single time we had to build a website. We had such fragmented in code and aesthetics across the board, but we were just doing the same thing every single time. We had the exact same needs. So why did we choose WordPress, though, for everything? Because previously, we weren't all WordPress. Um, so we already had some. Uh, but I think the thing that drew us most to WordPress is the fact that it's open source. And I guess I don't have to preach to an audience like this why open source is great, um, but it's constantly evolving. It's cost effective, it's flexible, it's scalable, um, it's SEO friendly and secure. Um, there's also a lot of training and documentation on the web already. Um, we didn't have to sort of, once again, reinvent the wheel, um, something that already existed was out there for us, and some of our users already had some WordPress knowledge. Um, and then when Gutenberg was announced in 2018, I believe, um, that was really the missing piece for us, because now, for the first time, WordPress could do native page builders. Um, and that really meant that we were able to take our websites to this next level. Um, we love that it's easy to use with drag and drop functionality. Um, we were really able to control it in a way um, so that it had a beautiful design ethos. And it's developer friendly. Um, we, as a development team, really, really love building in WordPress. We really, really love that it gives us more time to build the things that we love. So let's talk a little bit just about our design process and uh, how we got to where we got to. Um, so we are a really, really big company, and it is impossible to talk to every single team in that company. Um, so we sort of had this problem, is all of our websites that existed were not visually coherent. Um, so the first step in this process that we really did um, was go through and reevaluate one of those sites. Because we knew that we were going to have a large presence on the web, we really had the opportunity to do something here. And that was to be able to create that unifying visual fabric. Um, so we went through and evaluated sort of what makes everything the same. Um, so gradients are really big on Disney. We love color. 
Um, soft contrast between card elements and backgrounds, um, fun details like sparkles and animation, um, rounded corners and soft shapes, um, and colorful imagery really became what defined Disney. Um, we did have a design system at the time, um, but it was very much in its infancy, and uh, we, it was mostly mobile at the time. Um, so we've really sort of pushed it to that next level and really gave it its uh, uh, web presence, but oftentimes now when designers are thinking about design, they're not actually really thinking about web, which is a problem, because there's a lot of stuff on the web. Um, so that was really sort of the first activity we did is how can we really build um, this visual fabric together. Um, so this is like kind of a quick little aside, um, but we did a focus group style research process, really discover, really discover our voice. Um, so we quickly learned that the way the Disney cast members see Disney is not the way that other people see us. And the prime example of this was that Disney cast members absolutely love historical photos. We love little pictures of like Walt sitting on Main Street um, and really interacting with the characters. Um, but when we were showing that to users, there was a big discrepancy because when they saw that, they said, Disney's old, Disney's outdated. Um, and I think really this process helped us to reorient ourselves and how we were actually presenting ourselves. Um, we ended up landing on sort of a visual style that we called Corporate Mickey. Um, so it really helped us, very cute, um, it really helped us define our audience and say, um, this is how as a corporation we present ourselves and this is how we present ourselves to consumers. Um, so the theme that we ended up building is called Aloha. Um, and we uh, were really trying to make the most of uh, our time constraints because um, we were definitely running up against some deadlines. Um, and so we used a strategy um, that we call build for one, build for everyone. Um, so how can we create a system that can be used, reused, and um, feel fresh every single time? Um, so. Uh, Aloha has a set of child themes that run different websites um, and it's designed to sort of benefit all platforms simultaneously. So when we build something for one platform, we go and we evaluate whether or not we can use it on other platforms to make sure that everything is used in a proper manner. Um, so in the end, um, we actually built about 50 custom Gutenberg blocks. Um, it's been a massive effort and they did not happen all at once. They happened in phases, um, but the result is this very unique Gutenberg page builder experience that allows you to drag and drop in these pre-designed visual elements that you can um, very quickly put stuff into and it's gonna look great every single time. Um, so how did we actually get to the place we were building each of these um, blocks. So uh, the first thing that we really did was scan the internet for these common visual patterns. And the one that I have up here is actually a really good example. Um, every single website and its mother uses this like one three icon mockup with like the text underneath, right? That we were going to have to do something similar. Um, so we went. Good? Am I good? Sorry. Um, so we went and kind of did this iterative design process to create these new patterns. Um, we did bring some external designers in to really kind of show us what was possible and try to see if the patterns that they were building fit into our pre-designed system. And if they didn't, um, either adapt what we already had or build new stuff. Um, so it's really kind of been a big process. Um, and I wanted to kind of do a quick little aside for any designers in the audience of um, how I act to the point of um, designing these blocks and thinking about them. Um, and I think it's a really good framework to talk about um, Gutenberg. Um, so there's a book called Atomic Design by Brad Frost. And in it, he explains um, a unique way to think about design patterns. Um, and that's to think about them as atoms, molecules, organisms, and templates. Um, so an atom is really like a basic UI element. So think this is 
your buttons, this is your input labels, these are all the little tiny things, these are what you're just gonna code in your CSS, right? Um, and then at the next level, we have molecules. So these are the combinations of it. So a form label, an input field, and a button end up becoming a search form, and a search form is a molecule, um, which ends up becoming a Gutenberg block. Um, and then an organism is sort of a collection of uh, molecules. <laughs> so think about it like a navigation bar. Um, there's drop down menus, sometimes there's buttons, sometimes there's login screens. Um, so this really is what ends up becoming Gutenberg patterns. It can also kind of be blocks depending on how you're building your blocks. We, we sometimes like are interchanged, our organisms are a little bit sometimes um, organisms more than they are molecules. Um, and then templates just end up being Gutenberg templates, end up being traditional WordPress PHP files, or really sets of blocks and patterns that you use over and over and over again that sort of define that visual fabric. Um, so when we were designing all of this, one thing became really clear to us, which was sort of the Gutenberg advantage. Um, we became able to really blur the lines between post and page. Um, and the powerful aspect of this is it's offered us so much more ability to capture search traffic. Um, so content can be more unique. We can have, instead of having unlisted posts, we can have unlisted posts that are actually pages. Um, we can put unique blocks into our posts to make them more interactive experiences rather than just read one list experiences. Um, so it, it's resulted in this environment where our sites feel like not just news, but experiences, and it's amazing. All right, so let's take you through some of the stuff that we built this year. So first things first, I um, just want to show you guys a little bit of our timeline and what we were working against. Um, so we went from zero to 60 websites on this platform in only two years. Our initial build out only took us about a year. Um, and since we have been building with other teams to be able to bring them onto this platform as well to scope out the unique things that they need and bring them on. In December 2023, we launched DisneyConnect.com, um, which is three websites. We launched our press websites in June, which is five. We launched Disney Parks blog in June as well, which is another big website. Um, and then we are in the process right now of launching it on our internal platform, which is an additional 50 websites. Um, so what I really wanted to kind of demonstrate by the slide is to show that like once we got going, the growth was just exponential. It gets so much faster to deploy this thing as you go. So I just mentioned all those products, so I kind of want to show you a little bit of the difference between the four. Um, and as a designer, it was really, really exciting to be able to um, design all four at the same time. Um, so right up top, top left, we have Disney Parks blog, um, which is our consumer news platform. And I'm sorry, these are mock-ups. This is not real content, just as an FYI. Um, if you see the lore Ipsum, that's what's going on. Um, but uh, you can see it's far more editorial style. We have that sidebar on the left that they can use to categorize and group content. Um, we have this very cool post-level theming that you can use to bring with your experiences just on the post level. Um, that top right, we have our internal sites, which are obviously our most basic. This is um, communications that are going out to our cast members. Um, our press rooms is a little bit of a step up. The audience for this guys is um, a journalist and news media. So it's definitely professional, but a little bit buttoned up. Um, and then our last one is our public affairs website, which is DisneyConnect.com. Um, so definitely a little bit more of an editorial experience because that's where we're telling our corporate stories. Um, so this was very cool to be able to see uh, on a high level all of these websites and what they ended up looking like. Give me just a sec. All right. Um, so first one uh, was Disney Connect. This was launched in December 2023. Um, and this URL is here. I encourage you all to like open it right now on your phone and look through it as I'm presenting this presentation. Please um, look at the website. Um, our audience here was public affairs. Um, so there are about three websites, one for our whole segment of Disney experiences and one for our um, 
each domestic park. Um, so we help to build this site and its purpose is to help build and manage our organization's reputation, boost corporate and social responsibility messaging, and help us quickly respond to false information and news events that are happening. Um, as a result, we needed something that was um, both fast and beautiful. Um, so I kind of say this is the most natural version of Aloha. Um, it serves as a place for us to visually build from. Um, and like I said, this was the one that we did initially, so it had our most user research. Um, and this team, to this day, is now pretty autonomous, which was our goal, which is awesome. Um, and uh, But we sort of step in and help them sometimes with key design messaging. Um, but the site is really pretty, and it's kind of a testament to how well it turned out that even though they are autonomous, it is still a beautiful website that's functioning really, really well. Um, so the ability to add in the blocks here is actually allowing us to do what we do best, which is tell stories. Um, so we can now react quicker to um, news and stories, and it's simple enough for anyone to do. Um, the variety allows us to deliver these really visual, impactful messages. This one here is our about page. Um, and uh, the blocks also allow us to explore unique visual theming throughout. In Disney, design is very serious business, and very, and we have a very big and diverse team. Um, so uh, we were really able to put our internal design chops to work on this website and continue to to this day. Um, so we love how that creative freedom really builds into the Gutenberg blocks. And then a touch of so <laughs> animation. I don't know if anyone else gets this, but animation is always like the highest requested feature on all of our websites. And there are ways to do it wrong. Um, so <laughs> you, you just don't want to do it on like everything and have the whole website be animated. But because we were doing it in this method, we're like, you are, you are enabling it and disabling it at the block level, at the individual level, then we could standardize it, first of all. So blocks only have specific animation options available to them. Um, and we could also um, really sort of build in those best, best practices. So I, uh, I put up here for you guys kind of some of our uh, design philosophies of how to really make animation work for anyone who is everyday building in code. And I did also put a little URL there if anyone is coding these things on a daily basis to really like get in there and get some real guidance. I definitely recommend this guide. Um, am I good? Sorry. Sorry, it's a little spotty. Um, but our animations should always be simple and used to highlight the most important content, or they can visually add a little bit of like jazz to um, things that weren't already very pretty. Um, there were things that were a little bit bland in uh, appearance. I also like to use it to highlight things that are interactive. Um, so things like cards often get um, uh, animation on a website. Um, and they, it should also not frustrate by duration and repetition. So don't keep cranking that thing out. Do it once and require a person to keep reloading the page if they want to see it. You get more page views that way anyway. Um, <laughs> and you don't want to negatively impact your experience. Don't have it be so long to get to the thing that they're just like, I just want to read the content, right? And also don't hinder anyone's ability to access content. Um, so this was really kind of the way that we were able to bring animation finally to the websites, what they've always been requesting, without, um, without going against some UX principles. Um, so the next one was our press rooms. Um, so the audience with this guy was our journalists, members of the press. Um, we have about five of these right now, um, more getting onboarded every They kind of have uh, custom taxonomies are kind of the thing that distinguish this platform above all others. Um, this team is very independent, um, but we help them with design and special cases, and I'll show you one of those cases today. Um, so 
our press teams ended up being a very complicated fix because of information architecture. Um, and we were also migrating them over from an old platform, so they already had some bad practices in place that we sort of had to work with. Um, each one is really unique in how they run their operations. Um, and But the commonality that brought them together was that they all had common asset types. So we created a set of custom taxonomies within WordPress to pull these asset types in automatically. Um, so I know it's very little, but the, the um, example I have on the screen is one of our media kits. So a media kit um, is a taxonomy that they can automatically group all of their um, asset types. So they have press releases, they have fact sheets, they have um, photos, videos, files, um, and it sort of automatically groups it all in in this wonderful little interactive um, tab format. Um, and once again, you guys can go and see how this is kind of working in action. Um, one of the site URLs is disneyconnect.com slash disneyworld-press. Um, so we were able to use then the built-in taxonomies to offer more ways to actually categorize the content. Um, so all of this ends up leading to more automated press processes on their part, um, but also flexibility and how they're actually organizing it and that freedom they were really craving. Um, so we were really able to create this environment where um, our goal was achieved of easier content discovery, but their goal was achieved of not totally reinventing the wheel, but also giving them something a little bit better than what they were working with before. Um, and then also just filling in the gaps. So Gutenberg really allows us now to fill in the gaps quickly for all edge cases. So one really great example is actually a press event that we had. Um, so what will happen is twice every season, the parks will bring in a lot of media members and they'll announce a whole bunch of things all at once. Um, so we had a landing page for this and we sent people straight to this landing page. Um, and it acted not only as a way for them to get the news live, but we also set it up in this way that it acted as an outline for them to be able to see everything that was coming up on that day. So it kind of served a dual event purpose. Um, and we used color for distinction. Um, so one of the cool things you can see is um, in one of these blocks, we have um, a link off to Tiana um, and it's a green button. And then when you go to that Tiana's Bayou Adventure page, um, it's using that green color scheme. Um, so being able to organize by color was something that we already had built in the system for other purposes that we were able to reuse um, and help them uh, organize their information architecture in a way that was unique um, to them and what they needed for that specific event. And then in many ways, the grand finale um, so Disney Parks blog launched in June um, and the audience was consumers. Uh, so it focuses not just on disseminating updates for Disney experiences in general, but also for building community. Um, it's visually the most fun out of the bunch. Um, this, has, this website has been around for 15 years and it was originally built in WordPress. And when it came around, it was like breaking, right? I mean, it's still called a blog. So it's like, you know, it was like, it was, it was top of the line at the time, um, but it was pretty much still exactly what it was 15 years ago when we got onto it. Um, and from, from the day that we figured out we were going to build it to the day that we had to deliver it, we had 60 days to deliver a 15-year-old website that had 21,000 posts. I know you just said what, I'm being for real. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the thing that was so that allowed us to do it so fast as one, um, it was definitely more templatized, right? This is a very traditional news site compared to what we already had. So it was a lot of just like building and redesigning WordPress templates. But what we also did as a design team is we went and applied this new visual theming to what we already had and reused all these blocks and all of these work um, that we had already done um, in a very new and unique way. Um, so I think one of the most special parts about uh, this platform is how we're starting to experiment integrating social. So on our latest post page, you can actually mix in um, TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube post right there in your feed, as well as other post content. 
um, which is really allowing us to boost our social platforms. Um, and then we're also experimenting in our posts of ways to um, connect that conversation back um, to social. Um, obviously, we all know that a lot of um, news and communications is heading towards social. Um, so we were trying to think about ways that we could work with it, not against it. Um, and see if we could really build that community in both places and have them be collaborative. Um, so like I said, we're still experimenting with this today, um, but our mixed uh, media feed is probably one of my favorite features of it. Um, as we continue to build blocks, new ones are just getting easier. Um, so this cutie little block up here, um, this was our homepage for D23. So D23 is um, an event that happens every two years for Disney, and it's where they announce like everything that's about to come to Disney, right? So they announce movies, they announce things that are coming to the park. Um, it's a really, really big deal. And we knew that year that they were gonna have this really cool music festival experience um, where they were gonna bring on bands and they were gonna like have our uh, chairman be like a rock star and it was it was really cool um, so what we ended up doing was building um, this really cool festival block um, and because it was so quick and because we already had so much precedent for it um, we were able to build something in just two weeks to be able to give to them um, something that they could actually get there and put in themselves because we didn't know what was coming. We were not the users of our websites. Um, so we were really able to offer them this user experience where they could go in and fill in that information. Um, and then that gave us time to actually focus on the interactivity and the animation elements of this block, um, which made it very special. And then we also deployed um, sort of a uh, landing page as well with this. Um, so the one thing Gutenberg Blocks is also enabling us to do is sort of create this more evergreen content experience. Evergreen meaning content that stays around for longer, that's relevant for longer. Um, so we, like I said, design is very serious business at Disney and these visuals were getting tweaked up until the last minute, um, but our block level theming really allowed us to do those tweaks with no um, effect to our process, no last minute code changes, um, we were really able to deliver something that was beautiful and stay around and support our um, users to actually populate this website as it was going up and as the event was happening. All right, um, so those are all of our products. Um, but what I wanted to do was kind of just leave you guys with a couple little takeaways of what we had um, and things we've learned throughout this process. Um, the first things first is that the end product is everything. The hardest truth is perhaps that no one cares how much time it took you to build it. No one cares. Um, the, they don't care how it's built. They don't care about the technical feasibility of the thing. They really just care that they get a pretty website out of it. Um, and sometimes that means giving them specific options so we make sure it's always a pretty website. Sometimes that's compromising on the things that really don't matter. Um, it's, it's hard for a developer to swallow that one personally, um, but, uh, but yeah. <laughs> um, always assume that your users know nothing. Um, <laughs> many people that build on the web now are just simply not web designers. Um, so the more that we can actually build best practices and good UX experience and good accessibility into our products, I mean, not only are we lifting the boat of everyone who's using the product, but we're lifting the boat of the web. Um, let's all try to get to a place where um, we make a great experience a given every time. Um, never stop experimenting. Um, we are constantly trying new things, methods, and strategies from our system. Um, some things have really surprised us with our SEO methods. Um, and if you really build in that flexibility from the start, then it allows you to keep pivoting and keep experimenting. Um, and that experiment experimentation phase is really what we're in right now. Um, and it's kind of what's getting us to that next level. Um, Use your limitations to 
your strengths. Um, so our very small team, um, we got to bring on some extra help while we were doing this, um, but our team is like six or eight people on a good day. Um, it's 10 people right now, it's very big and merry, um, but uh, we needed to create something that's reusable, which ended up being our superpower. Um, we knew that we had a wide user base um, and we needed to build something for them. Um, so we created a system where blocks are reusable um, and minimal work is needed to get um, many new websites launched. So the enthusiasm around this product has been massive. It's been overwhelming. Um, but I think the strength came from our team and the things that we've been doing every single day to make it a reality. Um, so I wanted to leave you with this. This is my team. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you. I was told we have time for some questions. Do we have time? Cool. Does anyone want to ask any questions? Or do you guys want to go to your break a little bit early? That's also fine, too. Go ahead. So um, with all the custom blocks that you built and all the things like that, how are you handling situations where you need to make an update to that block and then be able to update all the content that is already historic away from the block? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I actually, in the next session, we talk about this in our technical workshop, but we're actually using dynamic blocks. So every time that we make an update, it trickles through all of our sites automatically on a code deploy. So um, we really created a situation. We knew that was a problem. And obviously, our scale is massive. Um, so we created a situation for ourselves where we could um, update it and do it. So yeah, uh, via dynamic blocks is the answer. Hi. Hello. Um, how do you, you said you had like uh, 50 custom blocks. Mm -hmm. And you, do you, do you um, utilize Redux to communicate between the blocks? Do you, do you heavily use like Redux stores? We do not, actually. Interesting. Yeah. Come talk to me about it. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the most, Brian, over here. Hey, good morning. <laughs> I'm wondering what your accessibility... Is it on? Can you hear me? I'm wondering what your accessibility testing process is. Yeah, sure. Um, so we use... Um, we actually have some um, products that our teams have put forth in-house to help with our, all of our accessibility testing. Um, but I also use a series of um, tests as well. Um, it's sort of easy at the scale because we the the way that we've sort of built the product is that um, it's very it's very quick from a quick glance to be able to do it um, but there are still some issues we have like uh, as you know if an alt tag doesn't get filled in on WordPress then an alt tag doesn't get filled in so there's all these like little um, ways we're still investigating to try to reinforce good accessibility practices in our users um, but we have a series of tools to be able to test all of those things and make sure um, we're meeting all of those standards. So, yeah, of course. We have room for one more question. Bam. We're going to be. Yeah. <laughs> you said that um, blocks have enabled you to do some more SEO experimentation. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, two examples I kind of have. Um, one thing that's been very interesting is our D23 page that we launched. Um, Things, it was a very uh, secure event, so we could only um, put the page up so fast before we did it. Um, so that was kind of a little bit of an experimentation to see if we posted a um, static page, if we could get more boost. Um, so one of the things we're experimenting with is taking these topic tags and SEO terms that we can't necessarily name every single one of our posts. Um, and creating pages that fulfill that SEO purpose, it, purpose. So that's one of the things we're doing. Um, we're also experimenting with um, continually updating a post. 
um, and seeing how that's working. And once again, building that landing page experience more through a post. Um, so one of the ones that we have that's performing really well right now is we have a um, post for the Disney treasure um, that is updated, I'd say every week or so about the ship's progress. Um, and that one's been performing really well. And by us putting blocks into that page, it's sort of become that team's um, main source of like disseminating that information, creating that experience. Um, so it's kind of in tandem. We're doing it with pages, with trying to capture some of the keywords we're missing, and we're doing it with posts, trying to see if continually updating a post is getting us more boost. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, thank you guys so much.